Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very special session of DE Talks or Disruptive Literacy Talks. Uh, we enter the third week of talks today, uh, but the uh, the momentum of the talks has just picked up, and especially today because we have uh, the founder of uh, founder director of Language and Learning Foundation who's joining us. Uh, he has worked in the primary education sector for over two decades, uh, both within and uh, outside the government uh, ecosystems. Uh, he has led early grade reading programs across India, Asia and Africa. And uh, as an IS uh, officer, he served as the principal secretary of education with uh, the government of Assam and also led uh, the mission uh, of Sarva Shiksha Bihan mission as its mission director as well. Uh, he's after um, making a transition uh, out of uh, the civil services. He has also led positions at UNICEF India, Room to Read and Test India, and is also a widely published uh, author. Uh, it is uh, an absolute honor to have uh, Dr. Dheer Jingren uh, to join us in today's uh, session. Uh, Dheer Ji, thank you so much for your time uh, joining us today. Thank you, Masood, and thank you, Global Dream, for having me here. Uh, Thank you. The, uh, the honor is ours, uh, Dr. Jingren. Uh, so uh, we, uh, in this series of talks, we have looked at different, uh, at literacy from different perspectives. Uh, and today, the focus of a conversation, uh, you know, uh, coming from your very rich experience in early grade literacy in India. So we are wanting to explore what are the different solutions uh, and disruptive solutions that can work on a large scale. Uh, and we're really looking forward to learn more from your experience in India and even from experiences outside India as well. Uh, but to start with, uh, Dhirji, uh, it is very rare to see IAS officers, uh, you know, transitioning out early uh, from their career into a full time role in uh, education. So uh, what was the inspiration behind uh, this transition from your role as a civil servant to, you know, committing full time to the cause of early grade literacy and learning? Yeah, actually, I, I worked with the government for 26 years uh, as an IS officer. And out of this, about 20 years were in the education sector. I just managed to be under the radar and continue to do education, uh, to be in the education department everywhere. Uh, it, it isn't a very sought after department. You know, most officers would prefer to do, you know, commerce and uh, industry kind of posting. So I managed to be in education because I really had a passion for education, have a passion for education. It provided a great canvas uh, for, for trying out things at scale. Uh, but as you become senior in the civil service, you've got to do all kinds of roles. You, know, you can be in the coal or mining or industries or cooperation or veterinary sector. So having managed 20 years of continued work in education, uh, there came a stage where uh, I couldn't continue in education by being in the service. And since I was so attached to education, I decided to, uh, to take voluntary retirement, uh, but continue to work in education and with the government system, because I do believe that scale is important, as you were saying, and the mandate for working at scale is with the government. So therefore, the way we have uh, defined our work at Language and Learning Foundation is to support governments take high quality foundation learning programs to scale. And uh, I, I'm really happy that the foundation is working with the national government and seven state governments at this stage. Right. Uh, so uh, it, it must be uh, it, it must be interesting for you to uh, engage with the government from outside the government structure as well. So uh, uh, did your uh, you know uh, perspectives of approach towards um, uh, education and uh, literacy uh, did did that also see an you know evolution from uh, as you changed hats from a full time civil servant to uh, someone who is now working with the government but uh, in collaboration from outside. Yes, of course. I mean, it's continued learning for everyone. You have some ideas, you've, you've formulated some initial thoughts, in, uh, but then as you learn more about this, as you learn, try and understand what is the science of reading, uh, what is uh, multilingualism, what is multilingual education, my thinking and my approach uh, has also changed quite a bit. And uh, in a way, uh, from being a project manager, I've also uh, try to incorporate more uh, a pedagogical approach into the work we do over a period of time. 
Right. So you you mentioned about uh, multilingualism, and uh, I'm sure even when you were at the helm of affairs um, as a secretary of education, and now uh, looking at uh, implementing uh, quality early grade literacy programs across states, uh, there is so much diversity uh, in culture, language, even even within a small uh, district uh, in in a country. And here we are talking about uh, work across um, major landscapes across states in India. So. Uh, could you, uh, you know, uh, summarize or could you share your assessment for our audience as to what exactly is the challenge uh, of uh, multilingualism and how, what challenges does that pose uh, to uh, achieving, you know, quick early grade literacy uh, for our children? Right. So let me begin by, by first trying to define what literacy or early literacy is. And I think that's core to understanding how uh, multilingual uh, multilingualism and other aspects need to be built into it. Early literacy is not just simply a, a mechanistic learning of certain foundational skills through drills. Uh, for example, uh, decoding to be able to recognize uh, letters and combine them and read words. At the least, early literacy includes several abilities like being able to express oneself orally, to be able to read fluently with comprehension, and to write independently. In fact, I will go to the extent of saying that language and literacy, especially in the early grades or early years, are the strongest foundation for all learning. And often, a narrow view of early grade uh, literacy is taken and, and there is a risk even with the new education policy and the foundational literacy and numeracy mission, the FLN mission of defining literacy or foundational skills in literacy in a very narrow manner. And we have to be wary of that. Just to give you an example, uh, one of the most commonly held uh, theories of what uh, reading comprehension is, because reading comprehension is really at the heart of literacy or early literacy to be able to understand in a deep manner what you're reading. Now, the simple view of reading says that reading comprehension has got two major dimensions. One is language comprehension, and the other is word recognition or decoding, to be able to read words quickly or swiftly. Now, the question is this, that if language comprehension doesn't exist or is low, then reading comprehension is going to be low. And and early uh, learning, not just early language or early literacy, early learning will be reduced to rote memorization, choral repetition, and copywriting, which we see in many of our classrooms. So if we understand literacy to be about making deep meaning, to be able to think and reason, to be able to make inferences and opinions and express themselves orally and in writing, and not just what I mentioned, uh, to be able to decode and to be able to memorize and copyright texts, then there is no way but to use children's strong languages, familiar languages, or first languages to begin with. If, if our understanding is this, that young children should be able to, uh, to, 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 to speak and argue and have opinions and, and, and read with comprehension, it has to be in a language that they fully understand. And that's why it's very important to begin with that. NCRT has called this Samaj Ka Madhyam, languages that are the mediums of understanding. Of course, a very simple other way of looking at it is that if children children's languages are used, the languages they understand well, it leads to self-confidence and self-esteem in the classroom, which is the basis of all learning. There's been a lot of research to say that if children are, uh, you know, feel safe, they have high confidence level, uh, they think of themselves highly, self-efficacy, then they will learn better. And this can happen when uh, their languages find a place in the classroom. Now, of course, dominant languages, languages of the state, English, it's very important for children to learn those. So what I'm saying basically is this, that we begin with a strong foundation of languages that children know, and then build additional languages on that. And therefore, early literacy or foundational learning or FLN has to take India's multilingualism into account 
and build from languages that children know very well and add additional languages. Early grade literacy cannot be just about one language, one dominant language, and not just about reading and writing. It's the bridge between children's orality. When they come into school, they come speaking. They, they, they come with a lot of understanding of their context and experience to build on that, to build skills of reading and writing. Let's stop here. Right. Uh, Viji, uh, you, you mentioned about how important it is to, uh, to build a strong foundation in uh, the child's, uh, uh, you know, the language which they are uh, uh, getting their, uh, you know, uh, where they're coming, where the blood is coming from, their uh, mother tongue, uh, you know, the language which is spoken at home. It, it's so crucial that that initial yeah. uh, development of cognition, etc. happens in that language. Um, uh, if, if we look at uh, the problem of multilingualism, or uh, it, it can it is de definitely can be uh, an opportunity uh, in terms of diversity. Uh, but if we look at it uh, in terms of early grade literacy, and uh, if we see from uh, you know if we make a comparison between urban areas where there is uh, a lot of um, uh, migrant population, uh, and uh, uh, that automatically brings in different languages, different mother tongues as well, and where we see the official language or the medium of instruction is different uh, in the school. Uh, is uh, do we see any pattern where the challenge of multilingual education is different uh, in urban areas as compared to rural areas? Right. The challenge of multilingual education or using children's languages is quite different from one area to another, not just urban and rural. For example, in a remote tribal area, children may come into school just speaking their own home language and have no familiarity whatsoever with the medium of instruction that's used at school. There could be other areas where there are children of two or three language backgrounds in school. In an urban area, as you just said, there could be several languages inside the classroom. In another area, there could be a linked language, a language that most children understand. It's not their home language, but they understand that language. It's spoken widely outside, etc. So I think the answer to this is to try and understand what are the various linguistic situations? What languages do children speak and understand when they come to school? What is their understanding of the language that is used as the medium of instruction in school? What does the teacher know? Which languages does the teacher know? And once you have this kind of a linguistic mapping, then you devise ways. And the strategies will vary from place to place. At the core of the strategy, of course, is to try and see that children's languages can find place in the classroom and become uh, an important way in which uh, we can also add other languages. But the strategies will differ from place to place. And as you said, definitely between remote rural, tribal, rural, and urban areas. Right. Uh, here, we would also like to invite uh, comments and questions from the audience as well. Uh, and we, we will definitely try to take some of these questions uh, in during our session as well. Um, uh, Dirji, uh, you have been uh, at the you know at, at the forefront and the uh, thick of things of how literacy and you know early uh, grade education and education as a whole has been happening over two decades in India, uh, and uh, at this point uh, with the the very first year of the implementation of the national education policy, um, uh, what is your assessment of how this policy looks at transition of uh, children from uh, early grade learning or from early childhood learning in Anganwadis and preschools, uh, transitioning into early grade learning in uh, schools uh, in grades one and two. Uh, and uh, do you, uh, in your assessment, uh, do you feel that there is a gap uh, between this transition from early childhood uh, learning to early grade learning and what can be done to uh, improve that? Right, right. Uh, I'll call you Mashud if you don't mind, not Mashud Ji. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So, that that's yeah. completely fine. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, Mashud, that's a that's a very important question because uh, these are two worlds that haven't met for the past uh, several decades. The world of early childhood education, which is through Anganwadi system, and the school education, which is early grades, grades one, two, and three. Uh, also, because they're administered by different departments and ministries, there have been attempts to. To, for convergence and coordination. And I think the, the National Education Policy 2020 makes a very bold attempt uh, to treat foundational learning as one stage between ages three and eight or nine, 
which is early childhood education in grades one to three, uh, <clears throat> and also trying to see how there can be a seamless transition. So I think in intent, that is the farthest we have gone until now, and it's a very welcome step. Uh, what's most important in this, you talked about the seamless transition. The most important bridge between early childhood education and what we call early grades in schools is the age group five to six, which uh, the NEP has called Balvatika, uh, which is an intention to be a, a pre-primary class just before grade one. And this is a, a year, five to six. Right now, of course, a lot of five-year-old children are in grade one. But what the NEP envisages is that this is a part of early childhood education, but a bridge between these two. And this is the stage where the, uh, the requirements of foundational literacy and numeracy will be addressed in a somewhat structure, structured manner. We know that early childhood education is a holistic development of the child, including you know, uh, socio-emotional uh, health, other kinds of well-being, uh, play-way, activity-based uh, work. But Balvatika can be the stage where children transition between a completely uh, somewhat unstructured uh, kind of uh, activities in the classroom and two more structured at school, and then focusing on the domains of literacy and numeracy in that. So I consider this is a very important bridge. And it's very important that we get this right, the Balvatika 5 to 6. Uh, it shouldn't become very close to what happens in school today. We know that schools, uh, you know, there's too much discipline, emphasis on children sitting quietly, doing their work, doing their work, doing reading and writing only. That is not what should happen in Balvatika. But it should serve as a bridge. And it's, it's very important that the culture of the school learns from the ECE approach. The NEP very clearly says that the foundational approach about play-based, activity-based, children's context and experiences and languages being used, that approach must continue till grades two and three. So the biggest challenge is that change in the culture of the school uh, and the classroom, the way they function, and to draw a lot from what a good ECE approach is. So that, that's where I think these two uh, streams need to uh, come together, a lot of give and take, and the bridge is Balvatika. Right. Um, uh, you also mentioned that uh, uh, many uh, children who are uh, age five who should uh, maybe mm. be in a different structure are already enrolled in uh, grade one. Uh, and uh, in the uh, the data which, are, which has come up from Asar uh, wave one as well, uh, so it showed like a lot of children not enrolled. There's a spike in the number of children who are not enrolled, uh, especially at early days, because they are waiting for schools to reopen. Uh, so uh, if we are uh, if we come to the current context where uh, you know uh, there might be a situation where early grade uh, teachers will have to have children, uh, have, will have to deal with children, many of whom might not have had any uh, early uh, childhood education. Yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, and of course, the, uh, you know, the well-established losses in learning, which we are seeing. Uh, so, so there are existing students mm -hmm. and there are new students and the teachers have to manage both. Um, so in, in this context, uh, uh, would you like to share as to what kind of, you know, what do teachers need to prepare for now? What do early grade teachers need to be prepared and uh, are there any, uh, you know, innovative solutions which, uh, uh, which your uh, team has, uh, you know, is looking at to kind of help teachers, you know, prepare for this situation to be equipped uh, well? Very crucial question. And uh, I think it's very important that teachers and the education system as a whole realizes that whenever schools reopen, which may actually be the next academic session, the next couple of years at least are going to be very special years. They're not steady state regular years uh, like, like usual. And we cannot have business as usual there. These kids have not had an early childhood education. Some of them in grades three and four have not been to school or have had very limited exposure, done some home learning, but very limited in nature. The first important task for everyone, especially teachers, is to 
look into children's socio emotional well being provide them psychosocial support to ensure that children when they come to school they can talk freely about what their experiences were you know what 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 do they want to do school should not become a place where now you've come back we have to make up for your learning losses sit down and you know and read and write immediately it's very important to give children their spaces we don't know what they've been through we have some idea but it's very important that school provides them enough space through talk uh, less structured unstructured kind of sessions a lot of play way uh, play uh, elements etc and after that of course making a very clear structured design to help children bridge from what they have not learned to what they are supposed to learn to where they have to reach so for example a grade 3 child who's coming into grade 3 after not doing grade 1 and grade 2 at school at least will have to be taken through the curriculum of grade 1 and 2 uh in a manner that is uh, that helps the child learn uh with of course very thoughtful acceleration so that there is uh learning and and we are sure that all children are learning and at this stage the most crucial thing is many children will be falling behind they've come from environments where they've not had any exposure uh, no digital learning no mobile phones uh, so uh, a teacher has to be very very vigilant about where her class is who are the children who are struggling to learn provide them extra support and not assume that i have got a structured curriculum and take them through uh, you know wh whatever is designed so two things one is entirely going back to what children have missed and reteaching that curriculum that is very crucial and number 2 is teachers through regular assessments understanding where the class is where some children are and providing them extra support to be able to keep pace with the classroom uh, this will be very important uh, in the coming 2 years right uh, and as as you mentioned that uh, it's it's very important that uh you know this uh, uh, this uh, effort to to help children catch up should should not be like a mechanical you know push and pull to the child that you know sit here you, you have to catch up you know we we have to quickly move on to other things but it, it has to be it's going to be a major challenge for the teachers as well to have that uh, patience and that connect with the children uh because uh, children uh, as as you know as you mentioned are, are going through a especially difficult time uh you know not being able to socialize and not being able to be in that environment of fun and learning as well um here uh, we would like to uh, take one question from the audience as well um i think uh, we have one person here who's who's mentioned uh, thank you for reiterating the understanding around language learning in the early years what is your uh, uh, would want to understand your take on language learning or right, uh, <clears throat> language teaching in fact uh, okay the the person has yeah. corrected their comment okay. so uh, okay. here here uh, dev ji and i'll call you ji uh, with your permission um, is uh, how, how is the approach of um, your work which you are leading at language and learning foundation how is uh, in this current context how is how has llf adapted its approach to building capacity of teachers right right so uh, the language and learning foundation foundation's approach to early teaching of language and literacy is based on a lot of research evidence from across the world and india also there's so much evidence to say that literacy reading and writing is actually built on the foundation of oral language so one of our non negotiables is to spend a lot of time on developing children's oral language which also leads of course to good expression strong oral comprehension bridges between orality which children bring in and literacy so one of the, the most important points that we emphasize in early uh, early grades language teaching is a focus on oral language development the second what we say is a balanced approach to teaching of literacy a balanced approach uh, very simply means not just focused on the skills the very simple skills of decoding letter recognition to be able to read the word simply to be able to write 
letters and words correctly those are very important but the balance means this plus and very strongly the second part is meaning making so a balanced literacy class has to have both instruction in skills and a practice in skills but even more importantly a lot of focus on meaning making in the oral domain reading as well as writing so this is where it's very important to ensure that there's balance uh, in the interest of time i'll highlight only these two aspects of uh, of language teaching that are absolutely crucial to our work uh, we also have a few other things but this is absolutely crucial right um we we also talked about uh, scale and uh, i think uh, right at the beginning you also mentioned that it's very important to uh, to work on scale and that's why uh, working with the government uh, uh, education ecosystem becomes very important so if you're talking about uh, you know uh, talking about these two very important inter interventions of uh, you know liter literacy and language and comprehension all all these you know this comprehensive approach to um, to language and early learning uh how 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 do uh, how does your team ensure that this is something which can work on a large scale uh, and can be sustained on a large scale right so uh we uh, as you said our belief is that change is required at scale because uh, there is a huge problem in children's uh, early foundation learning and we work with state government those are givens what we believe is this that what is required is not some simple small innovations what is required is a lot of hard work in transforming the way teaching and learning happens in classrooms i had mentioned this earlier that whether it's language or other subjects children will have to be active they have to be talking discussing debating uh, expressing themselves uh, you know uh, that's very important so that requires a complete transformation of the teaching and learning process and that will lead to improving student learning so what language and learning foundation uh, our approach is based on we do three kinds of work uh, with the state government number one is building capacity of all stakeholders in the government education system we call it continuous professional development so teachers block and cluster coordinators educational administrators diets all of them so that there is a shared understanding that early literacy and foundation learning is absolutely crucial and how can that be done in classroom there's a shared understanding across a very large number of people in the education system so that's our first pillar of work the second is to be able to demonstrate a transformative process and how schools can get transformed in a demonstration model in a particular area 200 schools or 500 schools to actually show along with the state government how a transformed teaching and learning can look like the way i describe where uh, children are active and they're 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 learning they're they're, they're they have uh, you know uh, they're reading and writing to be able to show this in a certain number of schools because seeing is believing the education system needs to see that this change is not just through professional development we are talking about what can be done but here it is it's been done by their own teachers and their own block and cluster coordinators that's the second pillar of what we do the third pillar is system reform uh, and working with the state government we can't do system reform in the state government but working with them to bring about changes in let's say the textbooks and workbooks pre service training the in service training Uh, assessment systems how do they how does a block or cluster coordinator go and support teachers in a classroom so how does the academic monitoring system work unless these kind of reforms come about slowly whatever gains you have as you were saying uh, will remain at small scale and will not be uh, will not be mainstream so our approach is what we call is a combination of two dimensions human centered and system focused education system is got human beings from teachers to the to to the state level focus on human beings their understanding their motivation for change and then of course address 
system reform also. Now, since you asked for scale, uh, bringing the experience that I have from my earlier work and what we've got in the last six years, we think there are uh, four or five things that are crucial if change is to sustain. And, and, and in the government system, that's very important. We, we, don't, we are not an NGO that believes in, 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 in doing and showing change in 200 schools and then walking away. Uh, we are completely committed to transformation at scale. So what we've isolated from our work is, first important thing is create a vision and a roadmap. The state government needs to do that uh, for change. It is, and this vision and roadmap should be shared with everyone. It should not be that it's just the secretary or the project director who's thinking about this, but it's shared down the line in the entire education ecosystem that this is where we want to go. This is what a good classroom looks like and what is the roadmap for reaching there. The second is consistent leadership. And that's been a problem uh, in the state government. Uh, that's a big issue in working with states is that there's a leadership change at the bureaucratic level, also political level. And each new person who comes in, comes in with new ideas, wants to do new things uh, with good intentions. But then that takes away from the consistency of that vision and roadmap. So we think that's absolutely crucial. Uh, we cannot do much about it, but we think that's a crucial in ingredient. The third is consultation and dialogue with teachers and others in the education ecosystem. We can't say we've come up with a new pedagogical approach, new way of doing things in the classroom. We know best. Take it. You have to do it. That will have limited impact. Some teachers will do it for some time uh, under uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of a threat or they think everyone's watching us. But as soon as the pressure is taken away, things will come back to, uh, back to usual. So what's very important is, uh, and what most programs don't do or most uh, uh, states don't do, is ongoing consultation and dialogue with teachers and others to ensure that they adopt it because they think this is a good way of doing things. And that is very important for change. I mean, there's so many other uh, models of change that are there in many sectors which emphasize that you've got to take the stakeholders with you. And, and they need to be convinced that change is important. Of course, along with this, we also believe that there must be champions of change who are available at decentralized levels. So you need to have people who are convinced about this change who will make it their own agenda, even if the government uh, staff isn't there or not available or no NGO. These champions will be will make it their mission to, to support that change. And uh, the last, of course, is that uh, engaging with parent and parents and community because anything any change that you want must be also known to parents and uh, community. They should demand it. They should think that if, if uh, the system starts going back on it, they should be able to say, but this is what we thought, and, and this is, should be happening. In the end, I think if all these things happen consistently over three to five years, then a norm is established. We reach a tipping point where this becomes a habit. This becomes codified. This becomes institutionalized. And it's, it's something which becomes the regular uh, way of doing things after that. And that is when implementation at scale really becomes successful. So I apologize for taking so much time, but it's important that we understand it's not enough to think of an innovation or think of a program. How do you ensure that all the ingredients are in place for a considerable period of time to ensure that that takes root in the system. Some some very important points that you've made. Uh, and I think uh, uh, each point deserves to have a separate detox schedule for that. Uh, sure, because sure. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is so very important. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, that it's not just, uh, you know, good enough to have a very innovative and uh, effective pedagogy. But when it comes to working at scale, uh, you know, making that connect with the stakeholders at all the different levels, uh, champions of change, you know, uh, making making the stakeholders see success, uh, short term successes, uh, which can convert into long, long term successes, you know, making it evident to them. It's so much important to, you know, keep the energy level uh, flowing. Uh, two points which you mentioned uh, is, uh, you know, one about uh, 
uh, making that connect with teachers and also with parents right so th that's something which i wanted to uh, also uh, ask you further uh, re regarding uh, regarding teachers you mentioned that you know it's it's important to uh, engage with them of course there are uh, you know traditionally we have so many you know different modalities like trainings or classroom observations and um, many other you know new aspects more recently we are seeing uh, online teacher capacity building as um, uh, as an important uh, strategy of engagement, mm -hmm. not just for uh, you know government's own uh, capacity building programs, but also um, with uh, uh, civil society organizations uh, also adopting it as well. Uh, so, yeah. if uh, if you would like to share as to how you know your experience and your team's experience has been with online teacher capacity building, what are the things that have worked, and what what would be some of the learnings uh, that need you know that needs uh, more work on. So, Mashud, let me begin with a caveat that just online learning is never going to be adequate if we are looking at transformative change in the way classrooms function. Because a transformation also includes many aspects of beliefs and attitudes that all children can learn. Uh, there are learners who are struggling. It could be because of their home environments. Their home languages should be used. Many of these things require discussion, debate which can happen through face-to-face. -face. It can happen through a lot of peer interaction, which is also uh, online in these circumstances. So I advocate and our organization advocates for a, uh, multiple modes of, uh, of teacher capacity building, teacher professional development, of which in such situations like we are in today, online learning is an important component, but it should not be the only one. Otherwise, uh, the kind of transformation we, we are looking at may not happen. So we've been working on teacher capacity building, teacher professional de development for the last six years on a variety of blended programs of varying durations. But as you just mentioned, over the past year, year and a quarter, uh, we focused on uh, online uh, training programs. Uh, I will talk about uh, uh, some findings that, that bring out some limitations of online learning and then what do we think can improve based on our learning? One, I think there is a big gap between uh, knowledge acquisition and what can happen in classrooms as practice. And very often, online programs do not provide a sense of accountability to actually bring about a change uh, in practice. Now, it's also true that in COVID times, that, that is not possible. But otherwise, uh, online programs often, uh, <clears throat> because you're watching a video, you're taking a quiz, it's also you know, academic and uh, a, a very knowledge-centered that it's quite divorced from what you have to do in, in school and, and, and actual practice. So that's, that's, that's a limitation that we have, uh, we have uh, looked at. The other is this, that uh, you know, sometimes a lot of uh, participants look at consumption of the content. You know, it's called consumption of uh, online content and, uh, and uh, quizzes uh, and assessments being completed as, you know, as the course completion. And that's what it is. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to do anything more than that. And therefore, we have seen that a fair share of participants are doing it because uh, they have been asked to do it or there's an expectation to do it. This can happen in any other mode also. Yeah, I'm not saying that, but I'm just, I'm just outlining the limitations that we have seen. Coming to the learning uh, for online courses and how they can be improved, and, and I think there's a lot of scope to do that. We haven't done it fully, and I think it's something we want to put it out in the public domain for everyone else. What we have seen is adding mentoring support. Again, online mentoring support adds a huge value to online courses online learning. This can be moderate support or high support in the sense that there's one moderator or a mentor for 20 participants or 50, 60, 70 participants, depending on what resources are available. But this person could help in organizing conference calls, clearing doubts, getting people together to talk about some issue, which adds a lot of value. So our first learning is the courses that had mentors and had more interaction of this kind, had higher completion rates and higher levels of engagement that we then, uh, you know, saw through the, through our uh, 
uh, feedback, uh, you know, uh, understanding the feedback from the participants. So first is additional mentoring support. The second is if these online courses are sort of mandated by the state government and, you know, it's become a part of the state government's plan and they say this is something that every teacher must do, the greater ownership of the state government, the follow up from the state government, then there is uh, a much higher completion rate uh, rather than the CSO pursuing it alone. So that's the second. The third and, and very, very important is that in the regions that we work in, parts of southern Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh, parts of Bihar, the uh, internet connectivity is quite low. And uh, most teachers we know work on mobile phones and with the data uh, that they have on their phones. And therefore, it's very important to design courses, programs for online learning that have a low data requirement and also content that e is easily accessible offline. We've seen in Chhattisgarh, for example, that 40-45% of teachers actually download PDFs when they get some connectivity and read them later. So uh, it's important to recognize, not make a very fancy, very heavy kind of course because we feel good about it, but look at that user who's in a remote part of Chhattisgarh or Bihar and what is her access to this. So that's been a big learning and we've incorporated this. Uh, the last, of course, uh, very uh, obvious is to have engaging, interactive and varied content uh, on, on, on the online courses, small chunks of reading materials, uh, a lot of variety with videos, podcasts, case studies, uh, you know, interactive activities like opinion polls, self-assessments, and even call to action. What we build into our courses are many calls to action. You can do this part of it. And then why don't you send us a picture of any new TLM that you've developed, a teaching and learning material that you've developed, or your thoughts in an audio about how you think you can implement it. It just makes the person more active and responsive to this. So that's, in a, in a nutshell, these are our four learnings from uh, our online course experience of the last uh, one and a half years. We were using online components earlier, earlier also, but pure online courses we've done since March 2020. Uh, that's very insightful, DJ. And I think a lot of people who um, are watching this talk and who will be watching uh, this talk, uh, who are working uh, in the area of teacher capacity building, not just in early grade literacy, but uh, other uh, themes as well, will find this very useful. Uh, it is, uh, I think, the crucial point which you made is that, uh, you know, the courses uh, need to be more centered around the realities of the teachers and not just to you know have good graphics and you know amazing content which makes us feel better as content creators but uh, also consider the realities of um, the environments in which teachers are working in um, uh, so uh, thank you thank you so much for that wonderful insight uh, here as well uh, one one follow up question on this was also uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, mentors, about coaches and, you know, facilitators uh, in these trainings, and it's important to have that connect with them. Uh, in uh, in your assessment, is it, uh, is it more meaningful to have these facilitators from within the government system as well, maybe people from the diet or from uh, CRCs, BRCs, etc., or uh, is, it, uh, is it something which, you know, uh, as a civil society mm -hmm. organization, uh, facilitators who are more aligned with the organization from the organization, are they able to do a better job? Or does, does this uh, matter in terms of who is the facilitator? No, it does matter. I think facilitators or mentors who we can work with and orient and, and who imbibe the approach very deeply are definitely, uh, you know, can make a bigger impact. That's true. And therefore, we work with mentors who we work with and we orient over long periods of time. But they can be 7, 10, 15, 20, uh, 50. But if you're talking about 100,000 teachers in a particular state or 40,000 teachers in a particular state, we cannot have mentors from outside the system. So what we do is we follow a process. We first have uh, people from the diets and block and cluster levels, some good teachers also, as decided by the state, 
to do the course first. And that course is mentored by a selected number of mentors from our side who are uh, who definitely have a, a, a very good understanding of what that's happening. And then based on their performance during this, and performance is not just about how much they scored on a quiz. The mentors are observing their interactions, uh, you know, how they, uh, they talk about things in a particular conference call, uh, what kind of assignments do they send in, uh, what is their level of commitment, and then do interviews and discussions with some of them to shortlist people, 50, 60, 70, uh, who can then serve as mentors for a much larger number of people. So the numbers being so large, uh, we definitely depend upon people from within the system at this intermediate layer, beginning with, with our own mentors first, but at this level. And we've been able to have mentors in, in several hundreds in states like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar who've done a good job. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that uh, they have done, uh, that they understand it to the academic depth, exactly how a mentor who's been, uh, who's been coached by LLF, but still, at least they've been the glue to get participants to, to discuss and talk uh, and, and put in a few things because they also get back to our people and ask questions so they can be supported on a regular basis. So it seems to be a model that is working and it, it helps to ameliorate some of the limitations of an online model uh, and put a mentoring aspect into online, even if it is limited. Hmm. Right. Um, Deerji, one more point which you mentioned um, uh, earlier was about parent engagement. Uh, and uh, it is it is well established that, uh, you know, parents have, you know, especially for younger children who spend almost three fourths of the time at home and at this point of time, almost maximum time at home, uh, the role of parents just becomes even more important. Um, uh, what what challenges do we face in when we talk about um, parent engagement of young children, uh, especially in the context of early grade literacy? And the, the challenge, uh, the context that we are working with uh, here is a large portion, a la large population of uh, young parents uh, cannot read uh, and write. They themselves have not had um, a lot of education and uh, they might, they are busy uh you know especially especially during because of covid and the financial distress which is also happening uh so it is uh are we are we you know uh, we are facing a situation where we have to help parents you know get buy in from them to to take uh, you know to contribute to uh, their child's early grade learning as well so what challenges uh, do you think uh, are there in this context, and how, how can the education system as a whole, uh, you know, promote parental engagement, especially uh, during uh, the COVID period? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think one of the biggest structural issues is that the school system has no faith in parents. Frankly, uh, we we look at uh, at parents and the community as more the reason for students' poor learning. A large number of teachers. Uh, not in a majority, but still, many teachers believe that the reason for children's low learning levels or some children not learning is because, you know, their home environments do, don't, do not have any literacy or uh, they speak a different home la language at home or parents are least concerned about their children. It's very common to hear this. So I think one of the biggest constraints is the school system should start believing that parents can contribute and should contribute. Now, to your point that parents are busy, many of them in many communities will be daily wage workers, uh, may not have the time, they go out early in the morning, early in the evening, uh, come back late. So parental support and engagement is always going to be very varied, a mixed bag. We cannot decide on a model and say every parent should do this. Someone who goes every day in the morning to a brick kiln is not going to be able to devote that much time uh, to their children. So while we work with parents, we must understand that parent engagement is going to be varied and, and we should not be overly dependent and assume that now we are working with parents. So a lot of the learning issues are taken care of. 
uh, that's not uh, you know what uh, that should not be the attitude but having said this in the covid time what we have seen in in the four states that we are working with uh, with with parents and community even parents who are illiterate have been able to make children sit down and this was also because many of them were not going to work during lockdown initially or there was an elder sibling there is always someone in the house who's uh, either an older person or an elder sibling or someone who's uh, in a secondary school uh, what we found is this that parents this has not been a big limitation they've been able to say acha kya kaam karna hai kaun si kitab hai kaun se page pe kaam kar rahe ho workbook ke usko kholo baith ke karo even if they're not providing academic supervision we found a very large number of parents and this we've seen through a small research we we did you know in in this home learning program that that we have done in four states where a majority of parents have said that they've found some time very varied you know from 30 minutes to more in the more affluent households to be able to sit down their children and get them to do their work where there was a smartphone available and available uh, at the time when uh, children were sitting for work that's another issue because the smartphones also go out when parents go out to work so uh, the videos and messages that we send out to support parents about how they can uh, support a child in this uh, suppose there's a storytelling going on what questions they can ask etc so a lot of it is an audio so even if the child, a parent is illiterate they can follow that and ask questions uh, but then again the limitation is that we know that uh, the uh, there is a huge digital gap uh, and, and and therefore there's limited uh, uh, limited focus but if i can take your question forward i don't know if you would want me to uh, what is the opportunity for the future is that okay uh yes i i think that that's something which uh, okay. which is uh, uh, in discussion as to how parents mm. uh, you know th th there is an opportunity as well uh, where we are seeing more parents uh, getting you know this uh, tripartite or the, these three brackets of you know school community home it, it's been just put together here so uh, uh, do you see that as an opportunity uh, as well uh, in the coming time sure. i do actually and and i even after recognizing that there are parents who will have severe limitations in the time they can spend with their uh, this not a homogeneous group our parents uh, is uh, quite different but there are ways in which the school and increasingly there is recognition now that the school cannot remain so distant from the community and and parents having seen these one one and a half years and what's going to happen in the next six months also that structurally arrangements like parent teacher meetings uh, student report cards events where parents can come to school even visit classrooms they have to become a, an integral part of the school calendar not as an add on ki thoda ho gaya to chalega not like that it's something which is a part of the school school's calendar year marking days for it year marking agendas for it structuring the agendas ensuring that it's done at a time where most parents can participate etc so i think one is a structural change in ensuring that we provide very clear opportunities to parents for participation and the other which organization like ours uh, can contribute to the first one is something which state governments uh, you know with with collaboration with us can really make an impact the second is to recognize home learning as a component of children's learning that learning is sort of mostly at school but for um, many kids there's a big opportunity for learning at home whether it's holidays after school uh, long vacations this can be in the form of whatsapp activities that are sent out to uh, to parents uh, those who have uh, smartphones but also simple story books and worksheets that can go out as part of workbooks you know a, a page or two that can be uh, that can be practiced by children in during the during a saturday or sunday or sometime when school is closed this can become a part of regular uh, work the school need not assume that uh, nothing will happen uh, as far as learning once children go home 
even suggesting different kinds of activities that parents can do with children at home uh, can be a part of all this. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, here, uh, DJ, I would also like to add uh, in, uh, in, in the question, in fact, that, uh, you know, when we see of, uh, you know, uh, in your experience as, um, uh, as a civil servant also, we see that the Department of uh, Education and Department of Literacy uh, are often housed, you know, within the same department, at least at the national level it is. Mm. Uh, and um, we, we see these, you know, uh, we see a lot of focus on uh, school education and we also have uh, literacy programs, which is, you know, uh, like we have the new uh, adult literacy program, Padna Likna Abhiyan, which talks about literacy for adolescents and adults, uh, 15 plus. Uh, so uh, when, when you think of, uh, you know, the literacy uh, in the home, like you mentioned that even parents who are not literate are still able to provide that psychosocial support to the children and you know enhance their learning uh, mm -hmm. do you feel that there uh, there needs to be a relook at or uh, at adult literacy what, what do you think should be the approach towards adult literacy and uh, does that you know is that important uh, when we talk uh, about, about improving uh, early grade literacy uh, as well do you, do you feel that there is any uh, connection or resonance Right, right. So uh, I'm, I'm smiling because I started my, uh, what do you say, my love for education uh, very young uh, by leading the adult literacy campaign. If you remember in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, there was a lot of energy and vibrancy around literacy campaigns. Uh, you, were too, you were not even born then probably, but uh, literacy campaigns were where uh, you could find so much of volunteering effort and, and, and it was it was a great time, great energy at that time. We don't see it now. Uh, and I do agree that there is a, a connect between uh, children's and early learning and parental education. I mean, there's so many studies that have shown that. In the departments and the ministry, you said there's a part of the same department. It's true. Uh, there is a Department of School Education and Literacy in the government of India. And many states, there is a Department of School and Mass Education, for example, Orissa. So they sort of sit separately with the same person heading it. But otherwise, they don't work with any kind of interaction or you know, commonality. So the synergies we are kind of losing in that. And, and it's important that uh, there should be uh, a lot of interaction there. My issue with adult literacy, the way it's implemented earlier also and even now, the focus is very limited on adults learning some very mechanical uh, decoding skills and deciphering print so they can read Papa, Mama, Baba, or a few other kind of words, and with a very limited functional use, poster per liya, ya, you know, koi ek uh, uh, chota sa road ka sign per liya. The functionality of it is, uh, is, is the way it's, it's talked about in these literacy classes is a limited use. And a lot of writing is also focused on, in a way, copywriting. So what I feel is this, that as we started, what is the definition of literacy? Literacy is about reading the word and through that, reading the world. So understanding everything around you through what you read and what you understand. And that simply, that comes when, uh, 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 when whatever they have learned in terms of uh, literacy, is used regularly, is practiced in meaningful situations. But the challenge is, and I as the head of the literacy campaign in two districts, my biggest worry was, what will they read after we've done these adult literacy classes? Kuch to hai nahi par, padne ke liye. So, uh, you know, graded reading materials. Yes, there were newspapers, but newspapers use a very difficult academic language that most people would find difficult to uh, to read and understand. And that is where I make a connect with children. Yes, children have uh, 
some textbooks which are which are simpler. Uh, I wish they were more interesting and engaging, and uh, and and interesting for uh, for adults to read as well. Uh, they can offer graded reading materials to practice newly learned literacy skills. So I think the understanding of adult literacy has to be widened, not just as basic functional literacy to be able to write your name or a little more than that, but how do you practice it on an ongoing basis for meaningful tasks, including to be able to support their children, but not limited to that. And you're absolutely right. There have been studies of different programs where if mother's literacy or education has been done parallelly along with promoting uh, children's education, the impact has been higher because mothers have taken greater interest uh, in supporting children's education. And also, of course, understanding a little bit of what is there in the textbook. So I think we've got to work. Uh, on both ends, uh, ensuring that adult literacy uh, is understood in a manner that is not so limited. And of course, make it aspirational. Right now, adult literacy, if you ask, koi kaam nahi karna chata, adult literacy mein. I'm talking about the government system. Punishment posting hai, adult literacy ki. Hai na? So, usko badalna hai. Usko badalna hai. Adult literacy must become like it was in the early 90s, become aspirational. And also, as you were saying, to be then see how it can contribute and how it gets linked to parental support to children's education. So, yeah, I, I agree. Right. right. Uh, a very, very important one and, and very interesting perspectives um, from your days uh, as a civil servant also. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and, uh, and like you mentioned that, you know, literacy is not just about reading the words, but also reading about the world. So. That's definitely a quote which um, uh, which 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 really sticks and which which really pins uh, you know the the nerve of what literacy should be imagined as and not just you know decoding words. Uh, I think we'll just take one last question from the audience and move towards conclusion. Uh, as as we know that you you'll also uh, have to um, uh, uh, to join another meeting here. So we have uh, one question here from Shagari Chatterjee. Uh, and she's asking, how do we address multi-grade classrooms, specifically looking at ECE? Mm -hmm. And do you think there's a need, need to devise uh, the curriculum accordingly? Uh, so this, I think the, the multi-grade classroom challenge or children with multi, you know different grade levels uh, is, is definitely something which goes beyond ECE as well uh, in school. Uh, so your, your assessment uh, on this, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely crucial question. Uh, there's no point uh, uh, promoting an FLN mission if we cannot address the multi-grade issue. And as you were trying to say, uh, there are two kinds of issues here. One, that one teacher teaches two or more grades. That's multi-grade teaching. So there, you don't have a, one teacher for every grade. So classes one to five, there is, there's a school that may have only two teachers or three teachers. That's one. The other is multi-level that you were saying. Even within a classroom, children are at different levels of learning. It could be because of their early childhood experience. It could be because of their home environment. It could also be because of the way we teach. Uh, we do not support all children. Some children who are from a better background pick up and learn, and some others you know, keep falling behind. So multi-level. What we have is a multi-grade, multi-level situation. Now, if you say curriculum, I think the curriculum uh, need not be adjusted adjusted as much as in the COVID times, yes, the next two years, the curriculum must be reduced in breadth, uh, must be truncated. That's okay. But in general, what's more important is I think the, the textbooks and other materials that we have are not at the level of children. That must be addressed. And secondly, all kinds of programming that we do around foundational learning must assume that a teacher is working with children at different levels and therefore have very concrete suggestions about how can you do an oral language activity? How do you do storytelling and then ask questions of children of different age groups or different levels? If you were doing a writing task, how would you provide slightly differentiated writing tasks to children who may be of, at different levels? In a multi-grade situation, how do you divide time between a grade one and a grade two, 
what work can we give to grade two or grade three children and then come back to grade one to take up some oral language work. Now, this is a design we often forget to make. We simply say, take an ideal situation. This is how teaching should progress. We make wonderful lesson plans, uh, but they don't work because a teacher uh, really is handling uh, multi-grade and multi-level. So I think it's the responsibility of the state government and a lot of CSOs who are working in this area to try and define uh, ways of working in the classroom which take the multi-grade, multi-level situation into account. Right. Thank you, Deirji, for uh, for uh, answering that question. Uh, I think in uh, in conclusion, we would like to uh, we like to share with you also that um, uh, here at a Global Dream Literacy Initiative, we work with a lot of young people, uh, school children, or you know, young people who are in uh, villages and who live in the cities to uh, to take up the cause of uh, of literacy uh, for others mm -hmm. to you know to help them give that initial uh, trigger or that initial uh, support to you know, to, to dream, uh, to start this journey, to dream, to become literate, and then give that initial uh, support so that they can set on this journey. So um, uh, would you, what would your message be to young people, uh, you know, people who are in, uh, children who are in school, uh, students who are in colleges, and even we are seeing a lot of uh, young uh, organizations, uh, civil society organizations, they might not have very big teams or a lot of financial resources, but they are like, uh, you know, uh, committed towards uh, literacy and committed towards um, learning uh, for children, for young people. So, uh, as someone who um, who took the uh, who made the switch uh, from civil service to full time, you know, foundational uh, learning, uh, what would your message be uh, to those people and to the, also to those people who are still, you know, thinking whether they should um, commit full time to this cause? Right. So. Uh... This cannot be career counseling, uh, but what I want to say here is this, that there's a huge scope, of course, in COVID times to be uh, supporting parents and children, to be uh, supporting uh, language and literacy learning in the communities. Uh, definitely, that is very clearly defined. Not only our organization, Language and Learning Foundation, many others are doing this, so you can contact organizations in your area and, and find out how they can support. A large percentage of volunteers who supported this home and community learning program in the last one year in Haryana, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, and Bihar were school uh, children and college youth. Uh, colleges were closed, schools were closed, and they, they actually came forward. And they got recognition from the community. So that was a great experience uh, for us and for them. So that's as far as this. Even when schools open, we are we are quite clear the way the Indian school system is. I mean, we are working towards transformation. Slowly, there will be change. But given the very difficult multi-level, multi-grade situations, all learning cannot happen inside school. And therefore, I would encourage volunteers, youth who want to come into the education sector, uh, grassroots civil society organizations to promote learning outside school and this learning outside school may not be as structured as you know like a tuition class or t exactly promoting what happens in school because children uh, you know after school let's not do more of the same you know but library based school st uh, storybook based reading reading aloud to them getting mothers and communities dropping into these uh, you know sort of learning centers uh, taking responsibility talking about the village their history uh, their folk art, etc. Uh, also, a lot of uh, reading of storybooks and all of that. That is a that is a great way to learn because our schools are not doing enough of that. So let's just remember that early learning, especially early literacy, it takes time to get uh, strongly entrenched, and the schools are not offering enough opportunity for a lot of. Uh, let's say, uh, reading practice and engagement with books. And this should and must happen outside of school. And of course, building of the bridge between school and community. All of this is very fertile ground for young people to contribute to. And it can be through a civil society organization who's locally based. 
it can be through some bigger organizations who are looking out for uh, people in in these areas it can also be on your own to approach the school the you know the the block coordinator the block education officer and say that you would like to contribute to this many ways are there i think this is a very exciting time right now to be working in education especially foundational learning the system is very open to others contributing it wasn't the case uh, you know 5 or 10 years ago this is a time where either along with another organization or on your own if you approach and and very clearly say what you can do there is going to be acceptance of, of, of what what role you can uh, play for this so i think it's it's a great time to come into the um, education sector and especially uh, for early learning of children right uh, dr dheer jhiran ji thank you so much uh, for uh, for giving us your valuable time and uh, very very rich insights uh, into how uh, you you very well and elaborately described for in everyone what the challenges are uh, in terms of multilingual education what challenges that poses to early grade literacy uh, we covered a very wide canvas of not just you know uh, talking about teacher capacity building but we also talked about mm. parent engagement we uh, discussed uh, uh, online teacher capacity building what has worked what has not worked uh, and all the way you know to adult literacy so uh, so a very huge uh, canvas uh, that has been covered uh, in today's conversation thank you thank you so much for your uh, time and i think i would like to end uh, by uh, quoting you only where when you said that uh, you know literacy is not just about reading words it is about reading the world and that um, that is that is something which makes uh, gives a lot of true meaning and uh, value to a person's life uh, so we would like to thank you once again and uh, also would like to thank uh, all the audience members who are joining us and also to those who will be watching this video in the upcoming time uh, we hope that um, uh, you have learned uh, a lot uh, from this talk and also that uh, you'll uh, that we see you as a stakeholder in this uh, disruptive uh, mission of you know foundation literacy and numeracy which uh, all these all our stakeholders are working towards uh thank you once again we'll meet you the next day thank you thank you mashur bhat and global dreams and disruptive talks thank you so much for giving me this opportunity thank you